So good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the panel on race and segregation. Uh, my name is Larry Bobo, professor of sociology and African and African American studies here at Harvard University. Um, we have a really remarkably distinguished panel here this afternoon, uh, composed of Doug Massey, professor of sociology and public affairs at Princeton University. Uh, my colleague, Orlando Patterson, professor of sociology here at Harvard. Mary Patillo, professor of sociology at Northwestern University. And Patrick Sharkey, now assistant professor of sociology at New York University. Now, uh, for me, it, it feels really quite a special honor um, to be here, uh, in part because of who we are all honoring and recognizing today, but also uh, in part because I am not really a scholar of poverty per se, or a student of uh, urban areas and uh, economic disadvantage. For those of you who know, my principal calling card is that of a sociological social psychologist kind of broadly interested in race and the dynamics of race and racial attitudes. Nonetheless, uh, when the opportunity came to be part of this event honoring uh, my friend and colleague William Julius Wilson, where there was certainly nowhere else I would be, and I think if apropos dinner last night, I must have been one of those people who responded within the first 10 minutes. Um, to Bruce's email to set aside the time um, to do this. And so here's my non-tallied one minute <laughs> of love, respect, and appreciation for William Julius Wilson. What I've always deeply admired about his work, in particular a book like The Truly Disadvantaged, is that he takes up an urgently important problem. He decides to tackle it with clarity and honesty, not with uh, political presumption and ideology and worry about saying the hard thing or the difficult thing, then brings theoretical rigor to crafting an answer and a just unabashed commitment to evidence. That uh, anecdote and storytelling are never good enough for Bill. It's what does the evidence actually show? How does it fit within a theoretical logic? And how does it help us make progress on this urgently important social problem. And so for exemplifying all of those values as a social scientist, I always want to take uh, my hat off to Bill and will always, like I think all the rest of you, draw inspiration from it. Now this panel today is going to be able to bring many different slices and lenses to, to this discussion. From the deepest expertise we could have on patterns of housing segregation and trends, to how immigration may be influencing and shaping neighborhoods through the role of education values and culture in perpetuating inequality, the prospects for status mobility, especially for the urban poor, and dynamics and frictions within the black middle class. I'll see you if you're following who's up here, you know I've touched on a bit of the work of all these very eminent uh, scholars here by saying that. What I want to start on, and I was originally going to cede my 10 minutes to the panel, but I decided, what the heck, I can put some slides together and <laughs> <laughs> consume my time. Yep. Um, and uh, many of us have talked about the importance, the impact, the path-breaking quality of the truly disadvantaged. The kind of note I want to hit at the beginning here is that in important ways, it was an intervention. And I think we're losing sight of the way in which it was an intervention in its time. And so I want to start with something that I hope jars all of you. Um, yeah, do you remember that? <laughs> there was this, and then there was, of course, the antidote. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, and it's in that note of crafting an intervention that I want to bring race back into the discussion. Because it's remarkable how we've dealt with race largely implicitly. There are marked bodies who are in a particular category, but race is not part of the analytical dynamic so far in any of the panels we've wrestled with. And now this may be the one place where we start to re-examine the need to do that. But I want to foreground this by going back to what it is Bill put on the table for us. So let's think about the agenda of the truly just event. Hey, this has got some elaborate effects in it. Given that my assistant did this 10 minutes ago, that's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> of course, he set out to elaborate an account of the new underclass at the time, or what we might now call the new ghetto poverty, and in particular to do so in a manner that allowed for the antidote, a reassertion of a strong progressive voice on uh, urban social policy, right? What do we need to do to reclaim policy leadership? Well, first of all, had to be honest about how the liberal message at that time was failing. <laughs> Remember, 
It's not enough to just talk about racism and discrimination in an age of improving rights and expanding black middle class, the introduction of affirmative action. How come the poor seem to be in worsening circumstances? Right? You need something different to tell that story. And in particular, this was still an era, you may recall, when we're getting articles on the strengths of black families, right? <laughs> Coming out during this era. So some change in how the discourse was proceeding had to take place. Of course, there were the shortcomings of the conservative approach. Somehow we've managed not to dwell on that at all, and I'm not going to waste much more breath right there now either. Uh, part of what Bill did, though, was to be deeply clear about the magnitude of the problem we were faced and talk about it in honest terms. So I just reproduced table one here, which I don't want you to focus on except for column two, showing that especially for violent crime, a group that's 11, 12 percent of the population is responsible for 50 percent of the homicides, right? You have to talk about that honestly if we're going to get somewhere as social scientists trying to influence um, a public policy debate, and that's what the truly disadvantaged did. All right, we'll rehearse that, rehearse that. The last part I want to begin to riff off of is this last point, that historic racial discrimination, while having set the table, as it were, having built the ghetto, undermined the educational uh, uh, opportunities that African Americans had at a point at which the economy changed, if we're to understand why things are getting worse for the urban poor, we can't just look at what historically built the ghetto. We've now got to raise questions about what the contemporary dynamics are. And Bill raised profound questions about the extent to which contemporary racism or discrimination were really a piece of the problem. And as we know, he sketched a pretty complete alternative analysis. You've seen different versions of this slide, including uh, Larry Katz's version of it. This is my version of it for my classes. Um, and boom, you know, the, the, that part of the pitch. What I want to do now um, is just hit a few of the high points with respect to reinserting a concern with race into our discourse inspired by and following on the heels of the publication of The Truly Disadvantaged. And I'm hitting high points because I am a sociological social psychologist. I'm not a student of um, poverty. And so all you other people with the real deep expertise here, you're going to get your turn. Um, one point to start with, it's clear that discrimination still persists. It may well be true, as Jim Heckman puts it, that discrimination is no longer the first order problem confronting African Americans, but it is still there as an issue. We know this uh, in studies of the labor force, for example, even from the Urban Poverty and Family Life Project, the work of Jolene Kirschman and Catherine Neckerman, as well as of Bill and When Work Disappears and their qualitative interviews make it clear employers, even in the very low skill se sector, have a very racially and ethnically coded view of the labor market and potential employees, where they will work and look for workers, and certainly who they will hire. Similarly, Harry Holzer's uh, systematic surveys show as well clear patterns of preference and bias among employers. And of course, we've had some very powerful auditing studies, both by economists and sociologists, documenting discrimination, again, both at the very low skill sector of the labor market and at uh, higher level or white collar occupations. You could tell a somewhat similar narrative in the housing market where discrimination goes on, discrimi segregation remains high, though not at the rates it was circa 1970. Uh, and the last, I think, real national auditing data we had goes back all the way to 2000, but I think Doug will bear me out that it still found very high rates of steering, realtor bias, closed doors and the like for African Americans uh, and Latinos. So it's still there. And we need to think about how that continues to influence the larger dynamics of inequality. Deep economic uh, inequalities remain, and I'm not going to try to rehearse all of those because we've seen snippets of good pictures of it from Barry Bluestone's remarks this morning, Harry Holzer's remarks uh, this morning, especially Paul Jargowski's, and I want to come back to that in the end because I think there's kind of an ironic twist on what uh, Jargowski put on the table that, that I want to return to, and they were all better to show it to you, but some of those disparities are really quite gargantuan along a racial divide. More critically for us, I think the African-American middle class is still far less able to pass on its status uh, to its children. And the gaps there, as emphasized in a Pew study published just last year, are really quite astronomical. Probably at a better level than they were 20 years ago, but still orders of magnitude behind the capacity of middle class whites to pass on their status uh, to their children. 
Fourthly, and this is the one that troubles me most, there are some domains in which we actually see a widening racial divide, not a narrowing racial divide. The clearest one being with regard to wealth. If we were to think about the time that Oliver and Shapiro first published Black Wealth, White Wealth, they pointed to a roughly 11 to 1 black-white disparity in accumulated wealth uh, and assets. Others tried to correct that, bring it down to a 5 to 1 or 6 to 1 ratio if you're just looking at PSID data, which might have had a fuller, more complete assessment of wealth. Well, what do the most recent numbers show? It got much worse over the course of the uh, Wall Street boom years. Uh, and these are data from Tom Shapiro across the road here at Van Brandeis and his group showing a huge expansion uh, in the absolute magnitude of the black-white wealth disparity. Um, and part of what I want to underscore for you is that this includes what we like to think of and have assumed out of the picture by and large is the African-American middle class, that they have fallen behind virtually just as much as the African-American lower middle class and poor with respect to wealth. Here's the real figure, uh, and I, I love this one because that little red line at the bottom is high-income blacks in terms of accumulated wealth over the last 20 years. And that's pathetic, quite frankly. Uh, and let's recall the figures that Barry Bluestone showed us this morning, and according to a study from the Pew Institute published in July, if Oliver Shapiro identified for us a horrible black-white wealth gap in 1984 of 11 to 1, do you know what it is now? Today? It's 20 to 1. 20 to 1. And remember those figures Barry showed you. Took a small mean or median asset value of eight or nine thousand dollars and slash it in half, right? This is not a good picture in an economy where more and more of us will have to undergo job transitions, meaning you will have to be, have savings to fall back on in order to not lose your house and put food on the table, right? There are going to be many, many more African Americans not in a position to sustain themselves through that kind of a transition. In addition, we know that the cost of health, ooh, I'm at two minutes. I got all the good stuff to go. All right, <laughs> you got the picture. Incarceration, Bruce, I hope you talk about it. I'm not gonna do the figures. Um, <laughs> the real point of the talk here, though, is that race is a durable subtext of our local, state, and national politics. As I said at the talk at Yale just last week, I'm sorry, Bill, I feel like I'm <laughs> always going back to this. Uh, it constrains our capability to respond to poverty and growing uh, inequality. And I'm going to skip a lot of these figures uh, and do this wonderful quote from uh, Tom Edsel. And I won't do the quote. It's just that there's a segment of people who you might think of as a natural uh, left Democrat coalition who move to the right primarily on the basis of race. All right? And that that's still out there and still real. Jim Crow segregation, nobody advocates it anymore. Positive trend data and attitudes show that. Proof positive, Obama was able to get elected president as symbolized by these sort of data. Nonetheless, negative stereotypes of African Americans, improving too, but still pretty commonplace to a remarkable degree. And there's the biggie. I'm sorry to be doing this so fast. What's called racial resentment. 75% of white Americans, 60% of blacks buying the idea that blacks need to get ahead on their own without any special help from government uh, or anybody else. It means something totally different for blacks than it does for whites. Let's ignore the black data for the moment and give you a taste of what happens when you ask a white person to explain why they feel that way. Um, here's a great quote from some guy from Arizona. Nationally representative survey in 09. I'm honestly tired of hearing about black discrimination. It's over with, done with, the blacks are the ones who want to keep it alive because they want everything free and don't want to work for anything. Too many of them are trying to make money off their ancestors. Slaves, and there are just as many other races who worked the fields and were mistreated. I'm tired of hearing about it. I think they should get over it or leave and go back to their country. My, <laughs> my mother is Caucasian. Her mother died at nine, and she had to work in the fields until she was 16. She didn't get any restitution. I'm tired of freeloaders in society who want everything given to them and don't want to work for anything. If they don't like it here, they should go back to their countries of origin and leave us alone. And people forget that it was black people who sold their own people into slavery. Skip Gates, not whites. Um, I'm, tired. I'm tired of hearing about this crap. Minorities have more opportunity than anyone these days, even illegals. Enough is enough, all right? So if you want to understand why the passage of Obama's Health Care Act was such a galvanizing event, this guy articulates it very well, and the nub of that thing is a set of racial resentments in a non-trivial segment of our voting public. 
we could do more of these. Here's a nice pithy quote from a Texan. Most of them don't want to work for a full day's pay when they can get food stamps and all other goodies for nothing. Why work, they say. We're going to get a house and food, and you white people are going to pay for it. We deserve it. Here's a longer one. This is the one that makes it clear they do see this is what upset them about Obama's health care plan, um, that that was a racial element. And now I'm going to quote Bill himself. I love this. This is a quote from There Goes the Neighborhood, Bill. You didn't know you were studying racial resentment, but you found it. Uh, and that's because it's out there. It's a real thing. And surveys have documented it for 20 years. And this guy says it. I hate to say this. <laughs> All right. This is not a direct quote from Bill. I'm sorry. <laughs> you get the point. You, you, you get the point of what this guy is saying. I'll just, I'll just let you read that. Um, so um, my point here then is that we do need to think very seriously about ways of re-articulating our understanding of the dynamics, perpetuation, and worsening of poverty with the ongoing significance of race in different domains of life. To be sure, Jim Crow and absolute barriers are behind us, but the stickiness, the glue, a thread in our political incapacity to respond to worsening inequality is race. And it's part of why I want to go back to Paul Jarkowski because sadly his data were the one encouraging sign here. There are more white people in concentrated poverty. <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe they will now get the point and see some deeper, <laughs> deeper commonality with their black brethren and not seeing them as the ones who are taking their goodies away from them. Uh, the thought crossed my mind. We can hope. Um, on that note, I'm going to begin to turn it over to the um, far more dedicated and serious scholars who people this panel. Uh, and in order in which we are shown in the program, I think we get um, Doug Massey, in many ways, whose book was one of the first major academic engagements with the truly disadvantaged, uh, American apartheid. And I don't know where Doug wants to go from, from there, but let me turn it over to Doug Massey. Nineteen eighty-seven was a good year. Uh, Bill Wilson published *A Truly Disadvantaged*, and he recruited me to the University of Chicago. And the University of Chicago was a great place to be uh, in the late eighties, early nineties. Hey. <laughs> Not that it isn't now, but it was the it was the place where all the work on urban poverty was going on, and. From my point of view, as a uh, longtime Chicago school uh, type sociologist and human ecologist, the most important thing that Bill's book accomplished was that it brought space and place back into discussions of stratification and poverty. Uh, if you look at what was going on in sociology uh, up until that point, it was dominated by the Wisconsin Status Attainment Model School where you had all these stratification processes going out in the ether, but they weren't anchored in, in any, any space. Space had just disappeared uh, from uh, the lexicon of sociologists. And economists were, just, you know, they were doing the same thing, running wage regressions that were out in a, you know, an unstructured ether economy that's not grounded anywhere. Bill's book really made that impossible to sustain and reintroduced space and place back into uh, academic discussions about um, well, the reproduction of poverty and the reproduction of advantage as well. Uh, so it was a great, great time for me to be at the University of Chicago because as I arrived, I was in the midst with Nancy Denton of a long-term project studying patterns of racial and ethnic segregation in the United States. And my uh, opinion, as it was forming at this time, was that the ongoing debate about the underclass and about urban poverty was missing a major structural element. That, that uh, a lot of what we saw happening was occurring because we were still very much a racially segregated society, and racial segregation was not some little neutral fact that just happened to uh, happened to occur in American cities. 
with no implications about uh, the welfare of the segregated people, but in fact was a linchpin in the broader system of American stratification. And so um, that was the argument that we tried to lay out in American Apartheid and tried to reinsert segregation as a problematic element in American life, not a neutral fact, something that was manufactured and created by white societies with, the, with white society with the deliberate intent of segregating and um, exploiting and uh, excluding African Americans. And I think uh, American apartheid was successful in that endeavor. Uh, people, start, people now talk about segregation as a problematic element in American life, whether they um, think it's increasing or decreasing or staying the same. The 2010 census just came out, and uh, uh, very early analyses gave us two very different perspectives. Ed Glazer here at Harvard and, and Jacob Vigder, Vigder at the Duke uh, heralded the end of the segregated century. Uh, meanwhile, John Logan at Brown University talks about stalled integration. And so I want to review where exactly we are with respect to segregation. And to do this, first thing we need to do is look at how urban America has changed. Urban America today is a very different place than it was when Bill was looking backwards using mainly 1980 census data. And the big shift is the massive rapid growth of the Latino population. Our brilliant immigration policy succeeded at the cost of many billions of dollars of doubling the net rate of undocumented population growth during the 1990s and 2000s. So there was a massive increase in Hispanic populations to the point where in 1970, Hispanics were about 4.7% uh, of the US population. Today, they're 16.3% of the population. And Mexicans by themselves are now larger than African Americans. Most of the people who arrived in the 1990s and 2000s were illegal. And illegality has become a defining feature of the Latino population in a way that simply was not true in the 1970s and 1980s. How has this played, these profound demographic changes played out in terms of segregation? What we have here are averages, average levels of segregation, black-white dissimilarity, uh, from 70 to 2010, in 287 metropolitan areas with consistently defined census tract grids. <clears throat> uh, the averages are weighted by the size of the populations, the black, the Latino, or the Asian population in the, in the metropolitan area. So it reflects the average experience of not, not the average city, but the average black person living in this set of metropolitan areas. As you can see, Black-white segregation has, in fact, been going down almost at a linear rate, about, um, at a about, uh, rate of about five percentage points per decade. Five points per decade. And it went from a very high 80, 78, down to a 60. 60 is considered generally the boundary of high segregation. Values above 60 are it's considered to be very high levels of segregation uh, and very clearly uh, is not simply a, a chance product of preferences. It's, you know, there's structural things going on to produce it. Um, despite the massive increase in Hispanics and the smaller but still significant increase in Asians, levels of segregation stayed more or less static. Didn't change very much. <clears throat> um, when you break trends down by size, you start to see some differences. Size of the black population. So, the top line shows uh, the level of black-white segregation in the nation's largest black communities. These cities are, these are 20 metropolitan areas that contain half of all African Americans. And there you see, uh, that, and then the second line shows uh, levels of segregation 
in, two, uh, in metropolitan areas that contain two-thirds of African Americans, and the third line down, three-fourths of African Americans, and the bottom line is the last set, the remaining 25%. So levels of segregation have actually gone down, indeed, into the low range, or the moderate range, but in places where very few black people live. And segregation remains high, clearly high, for at least half of all African Americans, uh, and, and uh, still fairly high for two-thirds of African Americans. The hyper-segregated cities that Nancy Denton and I identified in 1980 persisted in 1990 and 2000 and appear to be persisting in 2010. So size matters. The large black communities, the places, the ghettos of America, Baltimore, New York, Newark, Detroit, St. Louis, Atlanta, Cleveland, Philadelphia. Segregation remains stubbornly high, although declining, but still quite high. When you look at segregation patterns by the size of the Hispanic population using the same division points, you find that size doesn't matter nearly as much. And they're bunched much closer together. And when you look at Asians, size hardly matters at all. So something about a lot of black people in space threatens Americans in a way that is unique to African Americans and accounts for the resistance to integration that we observe uh, in large black communities in urban America. This looks at levels of neighborhood isolation. The percentage black in the neighborhood of the average black person and the percentage Hispanic in the neighbor, neighborhood of the average Hispanic person. And what you see here is that in keeping with the decline in black-white dissimilarity and the very small increase in the size of the black population, modest increase in the black population, levels of black spatial isolation have gone down. The other story, though, is that constant Hispanic-white dissimilarity in the context of a huge increase in Hispanic population has produced a rapid increase at about the same pace as the decrease of blacks, but in the other direction, rapid increase in the neighborhood isolation of Latinos. And Asians, given their very modest level of, black, of dissimilarity and their relatively small numbers, are not very isolated at all. And not surprisingly, size makes a big plays a big role here. So large black communities have much higher levels of isolation. It's going down everywhere, but the isolation levels remain quite high in large black communities. And size matters as well for Latinos and matters less for Asians. When we talk about segregation, we have a tendency to talk about minorities being segregated. But in fact, the really segregated people are whites. This is, um, these are probabilities of uh, within neighborhood contact. Uh, so the top line is white, white. That's the, like, that's the percentage white in the neighborhood of the average white person. And you can see that it's gone from 90, uh, 91% down to about 73%. Uh, but so whites still live in overwhelmingly in white, in white neighborhoods. And while the likelihood of contact within neighborhood contact has gone up for their contact with blacks and whites and Asians, it's, it's still very low. And for, for blacks, uh, it's only about, uh, on average, the typical white American lives in a neighborhood where 8% of the people are black. And of course, that's an average. That means there's lots of all white neighborhoods and a, and a small, much smaller number of integrated neighborhoods, and it averages out to 0.08. So um, I think that um, the declaration that we're at the end of the segregated century, uh, segregation's demise is announcing that uh, this demise is a bit premature. Uh, in fact, uh, segregation is persisting at rather high levels for large numbers of African Americans. At the same time that racial segregation is persisting, class segregation has risen unambiguously. And we're a more class-segregated society. 
Uh, <clears throat> and so um, uh, segregation still remains a major structuring factor in defining processes of stratification and inequality in the United States. I've been doing, I've continued to do research on the causes and consequences of segregation. One of the, a couple of papers I've published <laughs> analyzed a, a new and emergent cause of segregation. As Larry mentioned, discrimination still occurs, but it is declining. Uh, but new forms of discrimination, new forms of, uh, new forces producing segregation have arisen. And since 1970, larger and larger shares of suburban America have been covered by restrictive zoning ordinances that prevent higher density housing. And in work that I published with Jonathan Rothwell at the Brookings Institution, a former student of mine, we discovered that the, the stricter the density zoning regime, the less density allowed, the higher the level of segregation on the basis of both race and class. And that uh, metropolitan areas where suburbs have restrictive uh, zoning regulations integrate at a much slower pace. So new institutional mechanisms are being invented. And one final example to illustrate how segregation continues to play an important role in the ongoing process of stratification and perpetuation of poverty and disadvantage is that segregation, the level of black-white segregation, is the single strongest predictor of, of the number and rate of housing floor closures in the metropolitan area. And black-white segregation, when you do a two-stage least squares estimate with a very reliable instrument, turns out to be a strongly causal relationship. What happened was that segregation made predatory lending convenient and easy. Black neighborhoods were specifically targeted in a process of reverse redlining, whereas before they drew red lines and then they wouldn't loan to them. Now, in the, in the 90s and 2000s, they went out and papered black neighborhoods with flyers, went door to door, robocalled, hung out in the streets, targeting African Americans who had owned their houses, whereas foreclosures were more among whites and most common among people who bought new houses. Among African Americans, it's about it's most common among people who uh, owned their house and took out a, a, a home equity loan. They were targeted. They were deliberately steered into subprime mortgage packages, even if they qualified for regular loans. So black, because of segregation, black and Latino neighborhoods were specifically targeted for the predatory lending. This is where foreclosures are now concentrated. And this is the reason you see the, the massive increase in the wealth disparity. Because what Wall Street did was invent clever financial instruments to engage in a massive wave of asset stripping targeting black and Latino communities around the country that was structured and racialized on the basis of the continuing segregation of American cities. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Doug. Uh, it's my pleasure to now introduce a distinguished scholar who's written the magisterial book, Slavery and Social Death, The Ordeal of Integration and Rituals of Blood, and interrogated a number of these issues about race and inequality, my colleague, Professor Orlando Patterson. No, actually, for the first in a long time, I'm, I won't be using PowerPoint. Um, <laughs> I started it and um, <laughs> realized that I'm in an awkward situation talking about segregation after Doug Massey. Uh, for two reasons. He will have presented all the data necessary anyway. So, um, uh, but for another reason, <laughs> about 12 years ago, I wrote a book called The Ordeal of Integration. And um, 
I still stand by most of what I had to say in that work. Um, it is a view of changes that were taking place in America, as I saw it at that time. Um, and um, in a way, it was very much an outsider's view, because even though I've lived here for many decades, I still sort of maintain the, 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 the viewpoint of an outsider, which gives me an advantage. Um, and uh, in the sense of in looking at America, I inevitably I compared what was happening here with what was happening in the pa other parts of the world I know, in the Caribbean, in Latin America, and, uh, and in Britain, uh, in all these years I've lived. And, um, from that perspective, there's no doubt that there are enormous and significant changes in America, um, which uh, include uh, the issue of segregation. Um, and uh, perhaps too um, enthusiastically, I emphasize the fact that uh, America was way ahead of the rest of the world in many important areas of desegregation. Um, and, um, that included, for example, the need to distinguish between kinds of segregation and kinds of um, integration, um, so that in the political life, it is obvious that America is far more integrated than other racially pluralistic society. And my favorite comparison would be Brazil, which has a much larger numerical, uh, absolute and proportionate number of blacks. Uh, politically, America is a highly integrated society compared with Brazil and any other um, um, uh, multiracial society. The same had to do with the extraordinary role of his culture. His public culture is integrated. Black Americans have an influence, uh, and their culture is absorbed and integrated to a degree greater than any other um, mixed society. Um, in that regard, perhaps I exaggerated um, the degree of social um, integration. and. Um, Doug, of course, upbraided me uh, <laughs> in a review in which I was uh, accused of uh, lowballing. Um, uh, and he may have been right, because since then, I have come to recognize segregation as perhaps the single um, greatest problem which America um, faces, and um, one which is highlighted by the very fact of the public integration of the society, resulting in the ex extraordinary uh, fact of having a black president. Um, now, these um, points were in many ways anticipated in, in, in Bill's great work, which came at a time uh, which was very important in the history of sociology of race. And uh, I want to say something about that. Um, there's a long tradition of studying um, race and segregation in America, to which many great black sociologists contributed. And um, from Du Bois through Franklin Frazier to Craig Clark. And um, in that tradition, there's no doubt, of course, about the significance of segregation as a single most important factor. And the civil rights movement was predicated on the need for integration. Um, Martin Luther King, of course, um, the, the, repeatedly emphasized that as the goal. Um, culture was also seen in this discussion as important. And um, Bill cited Kenneth Clark's discussion of the way in which culture um, uh, operates in maintaining the problems of, 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 of um, blacks in the sense that people quite unselfconsciously discussed um, the problems created by years of segregation in, um, in the black community, especially among uh, the black poor, in generating patterns of behavior, uh, attitudes, values, which are self-destructive. And no one had an argument about that. This is widely held. By Du Bois, those of you who've read The Philadelphia Negro um, will know what I'm talking about. I mean, and, um, but the same goes for um, Frazier and others. Then came the 60s. And um, radical developments which took place there, um, culminating in the Moynihan Report. And um, one of the great things that uh, Bill did was, in fact, instead of avoiding this, to sort of confront this debate directly and to point out what its consequences were, um, not only in public policy terms, but in sociology itself. Because what happened was, of course, a debate over culture on the one hand, 
and a neglect of the issue of um, segregation on the other hand. Um, there are all sorts of reasons for the um, Moynihan sort of certainly phrased his, um, his, his argument um, badly, um, but it became the basis for the rejection of all cultural explanations. Certainly the culture of poverty argument was thoroughly and correctly um, uh, demolished. As early as 1968, in a work edited by Valentine on the culture of poverty. And it's remarkable that sociologists are still flogging that dead horse. Remarkable, too, because in many ways, Bill essentially summarized the argument and gave the sort of right response to it and pointed out that you know, we, should, we need to understand um, that culture is important. And I find it remarkable that I'm editing a book now on culture that I have to go over this debate again because I think Bill pretty well settled it. That sociologists had, in fact, in a sense, thrown out the baby with the bathwater. And, um, and uh, there was a need to bravely and honestly face up to the fact that uh, in some respects, uh, behaviors, cultural patterns were important. Um, that was important for sociology because it allowed several things to happen. This can't be emphasized enough. For almost a decade, as Bill pointed out, in his introduction in the first chapter of that book, sociologists had simply abandoned the field. No one would touch it. No one would touch the issue of, um, of behavior and culture. Uh, um, we had an absurd situation which had developed in which talk about the family was forbidden in correct sociological circles. Uh, unless, and this is the most absurd development, unless one defined um, what was going on in the um, uh, it, it, among the um, ghetto poor as, in fact, resilience and um, almost a new form, higher form of familial um, pattern. Uh, Bill faced that absurdity in the face and call it what it was. And um, his work, in a sense, made possible, uh, made it possible for sociologists to uh, return to the proper study of um, all aspects uh, of uh, black life and not simply um, keeping whole areas as uh, untouchable. And that for, for that alone, I'm grateful for, for that work. It's a turning point because people started slowly creeping back into looking at the family again. So, uh, he gave them cover, so to speak. And, um, and, and, and that was wonderful, uh, what you did, as if nothing else. But, um, in doing this, however, <clears throat> Bill, um, basic position in explaining the, um, the dilemmas of the, um, what he called the black on the class, then the term is no longer in use, but I'll use the term because that's the one he used. Uh, it's remarkable of terms coming <laughs> in and out of usage. Whatever happened to the word on the class, Bill? <laughs> anyway, um, I'm not here to defend that term. Uh, because I never use it myself. But anyway, in explaining the, the tragedy um, which he saw and which he rightly um, um, uh, criticized the sociological community for neglecting, um, um, Bill emphasized the element of, concentrated, of concentration and isolation, which is right. However, in doing so, he also emphasized culture. But he saw culture mainly as an intermediary um, factor. For him, the isolation generated certain cultural responses, uh, which then um, had the sort of um, outcomes which uh, were so disastrous. <coughs> that was a good move. At least it brought, made the study of culture respectable again. But I think, um, if you won't mind saying it, in a sense, sidelined culture as an intermediary factor. Okay, but still, it was good that he made it possible for us to talk about culture again, if only to say it's intermediary. That was good. In emphasizing isolation, too, one would have thought that he brought some attention to the issue of um, um, segregation, but in an odd way, he, he sidestepped the issue of segregation. Um, 
the, um, now, let me, let me clear here. I mean, he emphasized neighborhood and the concentrated poverty of neighborhood, which in a way implicitly involves the issue of segregation. But um, for him, what is critical there was the, um, the critical variables were the ways in which um, the concentrated poverty sort of resulted in and related to joblessness. And joblessness became the critical decisive factor in explaining um, um, outcomes. And um, that was the opening for Doug Massey to indicate that sociologists had in fact neglected um, the importance of segregation per se as a critical factor. Um, I've come to see that and to agree with Doug that that is indeed what is now most fundamental. That the great paradox of America today is in the midst of remarkable political integration and desegregation, um, we have this extraordinary um, social, persisting social segregation. And that this is what explains many of the puzzles and dilemmas that we see. Uh, now, Doug had also done something else. He, in, in searching for the mechanism by which segregation influences these outcomes, he also point to culture. Uh, he used the example of um, language, the fact that um, Lavabas and others, other linguists had shown that there's a remarkable development of a distinct sort of ghetto language. And he saw that as almost um, um, uh, 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 indicative of this broader cultural isolation. In that respect, he was on the right track. Um, and, um, but here's the interesting thing. While most sociologists praise American apartheid as a path-breaking work, and we'll say that segregation is important. Not many people followed through on Doug's. <laughs> this is one of these uh, highly praised work which is nonetheless neglected in the practice because um, the, um, the, for a long time, you know, since sociologists did not sort of take segregation very seriously. Um, we, we dutifully teach American apartheid in, 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 in classes, but um, how segregation matters um, is, was, 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 is this, no one has not been greatly explored. And the way in which the mechanisms by which it matters has not been sufficiently explored. And that mechanism is a cultural one. And the reason why it has not been explored is that culture still remains a contested area in sociology. There is still in the discipline a strong, almost dogmatic um, tendency to avoid seeing culture, cult, cultural as in any way causal. And there are good reasons for this, after the mess which um, the culture of poverty school had made of it. But unless one was prepared to view the role of culture, um, it, it's in, 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 in accounting for outcomes, one in fact couldn't really say exactly how segregation was important. And indeed, we got to the point where many prominent African Americans took the view that it was not important. Uh, my dear friend, uh, Glenn Lowry, who is looking at me there, um, <laughs> wrote, wrote an op-ed which is, I think, um, important and um, significant in which he pointed out um, in reference to the extraordinary fact that our schools are now more segregated than they were 40 years ago. Uh, I remember the phrase still sticks in my head, you know, that the important thing is, of course, the facilities that are made available, having good teachers and so on, and that black kids don't need to have to sit next to white kids to learn. Do you remember that wonderful expression, yes, Glenn? Sir. Okay, all right. <laughs> I didn't misquote you, did I? But I think you were, you, were, you, were, you were reflecting a general view among progressive um, blacks and among sociologists generally at that time. Now, the interesting thing uh, point I want to emphasize is that we need to explore in ways that do not repli replicate the mistakes of the old culture of poverty school, ways in which culture is indeed significant and the ways in which, in fact, 
It is the decisive intermediate variable that explains why this persisting segregation is the major factor explaining the persistent problems of black Americans. Not just low class black Americans, but also middle class black Americans. Because this is, this is the, 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 the really, one of the really terrible things about development um, is that black American middle class is that segregated as black low class. And so to the degree that segregation, in fact, is the critical and decisive factor, they, in fact, continue to share the same um, causal factor explaining their problems. And the problems persist. Um, now, what we've been doing um, is to pursue just this in recent work. And um, I want to just give you a brief um, taste of um, how, in fact, um, we go about this. Um, the, um, what we found in our work is that black Americans, including African American uh, youth and including the black poor, can be shown to share many of the mainstream cultural attributes. So it's easy in a superficial way to show that um, there really is not much, there seems to be not much cultural isolation. I mean, several people have done that. David Harding, for example, has recently argued just this point. Uh, he said there's great heterogeneity in, tell me when it's five, uh, five minutes. Aha! Right? <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> I'll get there. We'll give you uh, two minutes. <laughs> okay. Now, there you go. See? Okay. I negotiated some more time for you. <laughs> Don't take them from me. <laughs> uh, well, well, anyway, what, what our work is showing is that one needs a far more sophisticated grasp of what culture is and how culture works um, to see the way in which culture has been important, in fact. That, yes, indeed. Um, if, if one makes a fundamental distinction, and we draw a lot on recent work in cognitive science to, um, to the way we're looking at it, that a critical distinction we found is that between declarative knowledge structures and procedural knowledge structures. That, sure, blacks sh share a lot of mainstream declarative knowledge. Um, but the critical thing, of course, about culture is um, are the procedures. Not just what you know, but how you do things. Sometimes referred to as scripts, but it's more than that. There are two kinds of ways in which this procedural knowledge is critical. Um, on the individual level, yes, knowing the scripts, not just knowing this is the way the mainstream, uh, this is the mainstream knowledge, which black Americans are vastly exposed to, as Carl Nightingale showed in his wonderful book, On the Edge, some time ago. If you spend 40 hours a week looking at television. You know a lot about mainstream culture, but the, how you do it is largely unknown. And that has come out clearly in, in work we, uh, my, we've been doing, which Jackie Rivers and myself have done on, um, on um, um, low class um, uh, African Americans in Boston. Um, there's another though, important sense in which um, Procedural knowledge is critical, and that it's also distributive knowledge, not just on an individual level, but there's a kind of knowledge which emerges from interaction. Um, Hutchins, in his great book, Cognition in the Wild, makes this point. Now, to put it all in a nutshell, what I'm saying, what we found is that segregation, what it does is it excludes African Americans, not from the declarative knowledge, which one can easily show they share, and which partly explains sort of the, the ways in which they're so successful in popular culture. But they are <coughs> almost completely excluded from um, the scripts, the know-how of this knowledge, how you do it. And even more so, segregation excludes you from the distributed, the aggregated knowledge, which comes from living with um, um, people. And um, this point, of course, had been made long ago by Polanyi, 
that this is what he called tacit knowledge, tacit knowledge, sums up the part of this, both knowing the script and, know, and sort of experiencing the aggregated knowledge which comes from interaction. And it's only, yes, by interacting with, living with. It's the kind of knowledge you only get from being integrated. And so, yes, you need to sit next to a white kid to learn certain things uh, then. And um, to the degree that it explains to why middle class black Americans, um, the problems persist among them, not only in the fact that their kids don't do as well in school, but in the extraordinary fact, which came out in the Pew Research recently, that there's massive downward mobility among the black middle class. They don't have they didn't gain the income which places them in middle class with it through affirmative action or what have you. But by being segregated, they're excluded from this critical <coughs> procedural knowledge and the aggregated knowledge which only comes from living with, relating to, associated with, integrated with the people who, of course, have this knowledge. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Orlando. Our next speaker, oh, is Pat coming up? Is it, is it I think it's Mary. I think it's Mary. Yeah. It's Mary. <laughs> <laughs> Our next speaker is, is a distinguished sociologist who's written Black Picket Fences and Black on the Block. Please welcome Mary Patillo from Northwestern. Pat, I do think there there will actually be there would be good things that you could say before I go, but I'm actually going to follow very closely on where Orlando left off. Um, I'm going to try to get back to the fact that this is about the truly disadvantaged, but boy, there was a lot in there that I could go on about. I'm not going to. Let me begin with um, paying our homage to William Julius Wilson. Like Sandra, I went to the University of Chicago to grad school to study with Bill, and in my first semester went to him and said, I'm ready to get started. What you got? Um, and he had a study very in line with what I was interested in, which was studying non-poor African-American neighborhoods. At, when I read The Truly Disadvantaged, I, like many others, were, I was um, impacted deeply, but I was especially impacted because I didn't grow up in a neighborhood like that. I grew up in a lower middle class black neighborhood, and I thought, where are those neighborhoods in the research? And there was so much um, looking at concentrated poverty and not as much looking at the wide diversity of black neighborhoods that exist in this country. So. Um, when, when Bill left to University of Chicago to come to Harvard, I remember at the going away party, uh, all of the graduate students were around, and one of the things that I really took from that going away party was Bill told us, sure, you can criticize me, sure, you can challenge me, sure, you should move beyond me, just get me right. So he was like, you know, get my arguments right and then you can push forward. So hopefully in my talk today, I at least get your arguments right as I try to move us a little forward as well. In an edited volume commemorating the 50th anniversary of Brown v. Board of Education, which banned legal racial segregation in education by overturning the separate but equal doctrine established earlier in the Plessy versus Ferguson decision, the eminent legal scholar Derek Bell contributed a chapter in that volume entitled, quote, Judge Bell Dissenting. That is, Professor Bell took on the role of one of the nine Supreme Court justices who heard the Brown v. Board of Education case in 1954, a kind of hypothetical role, and instead of writing with the majority that overturned separate but equal, he dissented from that opinion, writing the following. Quote, I dissent today from the majority's decision in these cases because the detestable segregation in the public schools that the majority finds unconstitution, unconstitutional is a manifestation of the evil of racism, the depths and pervasiveness of which this court fails even to acknowledge, much less address and attempt to correct. The court's long overdue findings that Negroes are harmed by racial segregation is regrettably unaccompanied by an understanding of the economic, political, and psychological advantages whites gain because of that harm. I regret that the court fails to see in these cases the opportunity to lay bare the simplistic hypo hypocrisy of the separate but equal standard, not by overturning Plessy, but by ordering its strict enforcement. <laughs> 
definitely provocative. The Truly Disadvantaged is a book about macroeconomic changes in the labor market, neighborhood level, pro pains and problems, and cultural resources and responses in the, faces, in the face of economic hardship. But when we look at who are the people that Wilson is describing as truly disadvantaged, they are African Americans living in majority or all black neighborhoods. And those black, predominantly black neighborhoods are made possible because, as Doug pointed out in his slide, whites live in predominantly or all white neighborhoods. So there's always this relationship when we talk about racial segregation. So while Derrick Bell was addressing the issue of separate and unequal in the educational system, the truly disadvantaged is about the separate and unequal experience of blacks and whites in the residential landscape. And I actually find it interesting that, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to turn this into a, well, our panel is more important than all the rest of the panels, but I agree with, with Larry that the subtext of race throughout is to me surprising at how in other respects we are so precise with our language and so precise with our measurement and our concepts, but here there is an often fluid and uh, a fluid movement between race and class that never tries to think more pointedly about what is race, what is class, and why when we're talking about the truly disadvantaged, we are talking about black neighborhoods. Now I think there is this question about uh, how much the truly disadvantaged applies to Latino neighborhoods. I don't think there's been enough research on that topic, but surely the truly disadvantaged, the book, and surely much of the research that has come from it has been on African-American neighborhoods. Just, we've seen the slippage. Uh, 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 Professor Elwood was talking about uh, out of uh, non-marital birth, I mean non-marital, or what were you talking about? <laughs> non-marital births? I think it was non-marital births. You gave a statistic and Mary Jo Bain said, no, no, that's for black families. It was, it's almost as if we're giving the statistics for blacks as if that is the group that we're talking about without talking about them as statistics for blacks. So my own research is built on the truly disadvantaged to explore this racialized residential experience and its consequences for the black middle class, for black public housing residents, and most recently for black families maneuvering the public school landscape in Chicago. Let me give some brief, brief summaries and short vignettes to illustrate the separate and unequal that both Bell and Wilson describe, and then think about Bell's provocation in light of Wilson's work and what has grown from it. So in my first book, I ethnographically show how middle-class blacks live in places that are starkly separate and unequal to the places where middle-class whites live. And in, indeed, on any number of indicators, middle-class blacks on average live in neighborhoods that are worse than the neighborhoods where poor whites live. This is where I hope Pat will elaborate this on a little bit. It might have been better had he gone first. Hopefully he will elaborate, I won't hear. I recently updated black picket fences in my, and in an interview with Sheila Boone, um, in the neighborhood that I studied, Groveland, she said sarcastically, quote, well, there's nothing past the University of Chicago. Don't you know that? She was referring to the neglect of the predominantly African-American South Side of the city by downtown politicians, civic leaders, and business interests, unless, of course, there were profits to be made, which she talked about later in the foreclosure crisis and the extraction of wealth through that particular crisis. I was recently presenting this new research on Groveland to a group of incoming medical students at the University of Chicago, and one student asked me, why don't people just move? I think that's the question on many people's minds, and that is the policy response. When I present my research, especially on middle class blacks who ostensibly can move, people ask, why don't they just move? Well, the answers are complex, and of course, they slash we do move. I re-interviewed three of the young people who had grown up in Groveland in the 1990s when I was doing my research, and none of them still lived in the neighborhood. Chicago's black population declined by 180,000 people from 2000 to 2010, as did the black populations of cities across the country. Nationally, 2010 marked the first decade in which a majority of African Americans lived in the suburbs of the 100 largest metropolitan areas rather than within the city proper, whereas whites became majority suburban by 1970. But on the whole, moving doesn't translate into the same opportunities for blacks as for whites, as countless studies have shown that the suburban destinations of blacks are also separate and unequal. So why don't blacks move again or move to even better neighborhoods? Why don't I move? I think that the truly disadvantaged and work that has come from that emboldens us to answer the question, why should we have to move? 
The causes of disproportionate poverty, joblessness, bad schools, crime, and other disadvantages is not that people don't move, but that the labor market has moved around them and that other people are moving when they move in. And we've not made the collective political and economic decisions to take care of those places and those people who have been most severely impacted. And I would argue that we haven't made those decisions in part because of the perniciousness and the institutionalized nature of anti-black racism. The same emphasis on mobility or moving people is evident in the policy around public housing and other high poverty neighborhoods that aims to deconcentrate poverty by giving poor families housing choice vouchers or through de facto displacement through the demolition of public housing altogether. These policies are disproportionately aimed at black neighborhoods. In my study of the transformation of the North Kenwood Oakland neighborhood, another neighborhood on the south side of, the, of Chicago, I tell the story of the lakefront properties, which authorities announced were to be vacated to allow for renovation in 1986. Residents were skeptical, and so when everyone else was relocated, 30 residents stayed determined to monitor and enforce agreements that the public housing residents could come back after renovation. One organizational leader commented, quote, just because we're poor and living in public housing doesn't mean we'll allow ourselves to be taken advantage of. We'll do whatever is necessary to ensure that we remain where we're at. And they stayed in those buildings as the buildings were uh, dilapidating and no money was being pulled in. And eventually they were moved out because of safety reasons. And once they moved and their constituents were scattered across the metropolitan area, the buildings were eventually demolished. 25 years later, just last week, the development still is not complete and the, the presence of the public housing residents who had once lived there was commemorated just last week as, at a park naming ceremony for one of the tenant leaders. So there's no doubt that public housing in the US represents a key, clear case of separate and unequal. But the policy proposals in the truly disadvantaged focus on labor market and safety net reforms, meeting people where they are, and focusing on the equal part rather than mobility strategies that address the separate part. Most recently, I've begun to study schools and how mostly low-income black parents make choices about where to send their children to high school on Chicago's predominantly black South Side. I've come to put the word choice in quotation marks because of stories like the following that parents miss, like Miss Carter told me about how it came to be that her foster daughter Janice would be attending neighborhood high. The high school, it's the pseudonym obviously, the high school in her attendance area in which only a small minority of the students meet state benchmarks on standardized tests, less than half graduated, at least one third, third of the students student body was chronically truant, and less than one half of the students felt that the school provided a safe and respectful environment. Ms. Carter told me the following. I went to the counselor and I was just asking her, could she, give me, should, could she help me get Janice into Humphrey High School and the other school we chose, and the charter schools? So she circled some stuff that was in the Chicago Public Schools book, and then I went home and I called the charter schools. But they had did the lottery already, so it was too late for her to get in there. Then the counselor did tell me that Humphrey High School, you had to have your scores up, your standardized test scores up, and they do look at the seventh grade scores, and Janice's weren't that good, so her chances weren't good to get in Humphrey either. After that, I just waited for the letter of response of the schools that she did put down on her application, but we didn't hear from anybody, nobody but neighborhood high. So what, they send black kids where they want to send them? What did neighborhood high come, why did neighborhood high come up and we can't hear from any of the other schools? I don't like it because they sent neighborhood high and we didn't apply for it. Because like I said, it was chosen. There is not a lot in the truly disadvantaged about schools, but what there is underlines the point that bad schools and high poverty neighborhoods are a crucial part of generating negative outcomes. Racial and class segregation in schools and poor student outcomes persist in Chicago and other big city school districts. And this is the reality that faces Mrs. Carter and Janice as they try to choose a high school in Chicago. They live in the kind of high poverty neighborhood that Wilson discusses and are trying to navigate the institutions there and what they encounter is a relatively opaque system that offers a range of bad choices, is non-responsive, and that Ms. Carter wonders aloud if it's designed against her. What, they just send black kids where they want to send them, she asks? Yet school choice through the development of specialized honors, magnet, charter, and voucher school programs is currently the predominant policy remedy for improving the school outcomes of the truly disadvantaged. <clears throat> 
While school choice does not foreground the issue of race, I would argue that the philosophy behind choice is similar to that which motivated the desegregation of schools after Brown v. Board of Education, namely relying on the mobility of children, and most especially the mobility of black and increasingly brown children, to different kinds of schools as the route for improving the outcomes of poor children, specifically poor black children. Again, why don't poor black children and parents just move is the question. So the same focus on mobility exists in school and housing policies. Many scholars and policymakers have cited the truly disadvantaged for inspiring this emphasis on mobility, whether in neighborhoods or schools. And Bill already quoted today from his own afterward um, that he distances himself from these policies, saying, quote, my argument about the structural causes of concentrated poverty does not imply that these neighborhoods should be deconcentrated by displacing poor residents, end quote. Given Bill's own distancing from such a strategy, it's curious that policymakers have latched on to his research as the scientific basis for policies that emphasize class integration. But I would argue that Bell, Derek Bell's dissenting opinion offers us insight as to why housing and school choice and mobility programs are so popular. And that is that they do little to recognize the profoundly racist roots of the formation of the truly disadvantaged, the kind of um, anatomy of racial inequality that Glenn Lowry talks about in his book. And they also do little to challenge the advantages that whites, and I would add many affluent African Americans through a system of advanced marginalization that political scientist Kathy Cohen talks about, that whites and affluent African Americans receive as a result of this system. Bell argues that to truly challenge, challenge the privileges accrued as a result of separate and unequal, we need to attack the unequal part first, and the separate will follow. This is actually how I obviously come right after Orlando. <laughs> Hence, I make the argument in my work on public housing, on the, on the black middle class, and on schools, that we need to address the neighborhood context of the truly advantaged, and that involves targeting investment in poor black neighborhoods and poor African American people as and where they are. Not promoting mobility out of such neighborhoods or requiring that such neighborhoods attract upper income families in order to secure resources. We've talked a little bit about the Harlem Children's Zone. I won't go back there now because my time is out. And that's, I think, something to talk about. We've talked about it being underfunded. Indeed, Bill and Jim Kwan have an article where they talk about uh, the Harlem Children's Zone. I think it's something to discuss. We talked about, well, we don't have the political will. We don't have the money. But we have billions, trillions of dollars to go to war. We have billions of dollars to spend on homeowner mortgage tax exemptions. We have lots of money that we are not spending in these neighborhoods. So I'll end there. And uh, Thank you, Mary. That's terrific. We're going to have a great discussion shortly. I can feel it. Um, our next speaker is Patrick Sharkey, a product of this sociology department and social inequality program and doing just absolutely pathbreaking work along with Rob Sampson on neighborhoods, race, and uh, status mobility questions. So, Pat. Thanks, Larry. Sorry for trying to jump ahead of you. I'm like, do that. <laughs> um, but I do kind of feel like I'm, I don't know, maybe I'm uh, I, too engrossed in the debate. I feel like I'm kind of wading innocently into this <laughs> kind of uh, series there of There are no innocents, Pat. Well, so, <laughs> when, um, so the truly disadvantaged, as widely read as it was, didn't make it onto the playgrounds of my elementary school when I was, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, was uh, but, um, Where did you go to school? That's <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh, right. The, um, but it did resonate with me. I mean, Sandra's story uh, about how this book resonated uh, with you. I, you know, I was going to, to, uh, to school with the truly advantaged. Um, uh, uh, I was. I was very good friends with, with uh, several guys who would fall under, you know, uh, um, under the definition that used to be in play for the underclass. And so when I, when I got out of high school and when I observed what was happening to the, that group of friends, 
uh, who were, some of them were into some bad stuff and, and uh, had no opportunity to get out of uh, the, the situation they were in. Meanwhile, a lot of the guys that I went to school with, uh, the truly advantaged, were into some serious stuff too, um, were selling drugs, were into drugs, were not going to school very often, were not very bright as far as I could tell, and they were doing pretty well. Um, you know, bailed out several times, uh, either in college or 10 years later, you know, um, working for parents, uh, working via other networks, you know, doing just fine. So Bill's book uh, resonated with me, even though uh, it wasn't, you know, my personal uh, experience. And, and I have to say, like Sandra said, um, this book was one of the most important reasons why I wanted to do research. It was inspiring. It made me want to be a sociologist. Um, it was one of the major reasons why I came to Harvard. Um, it was, you know, irrationally, uh, it was why I was desperate to have my book published with the University of Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's had a profound impact on my life and, on, and definitely um, on my, my thinking. So, um, <laughs> uh, so I'm really appreciative, as with everyone else. Um, so one of the uh, themes that's come up a few times uh, is uh, over the course of the day is how the um, the forces that that Bill documented uh, and just the trends that he documented um, have intensified or at least still persist uh, today. There hasn't been much change. I want to make the more uh, general um, argument, kind of building off of this idea and building off some of what Rob Sampson was saying uh, earlier uh, about the the importance of continuity. And I'll I'll start with the claim. Uh, that the dominant feature of neighborhood inequality, and I'm going a little bit outside of just racial segregation here and talking in more general terms about neighborhood inequality. Um, so I'll make the kind of the general claim that the dominant feature of neighborhood inequality is continuity, and I'll talk about what I mean in a second. Um, and then uh, two other points about uh, what I think this means for how we study and how we understand uh, uh, neighborhood inequality, and then secondly, uh, or third, um, how we confront neighborhood inequality, and I'll build off some of uh, what Mary was just saying just now. Um, but first, what do I mean when I say the dominant feature of neighborhood inequality is continuity? Um, you will notice the influence of my advisor, Rob Sampson, and not uh, um, in this uh, scatter plot and in some of the other stuff, um, which has come out of collaborations um, uh, with Rob, and just his work has obviously shaped my thinking. Uh, substantially. Um, so this is, this is all U.S. neighborhoods and this is just neighborhood income in 1970 on the x-axis and 2000 on the y-axis. Uh, so this is over 30 years. Um, this is, you know, I think, I, I, I didn't delete it because I just think it's so powerful uh, as a demonstration of what I mean by neighborhood inequality. It's not just that the same types of neighborhoods are poor, that there are the same types, there's the same distribution as it was uh, in 1970, 1980, it's that the same physical uh, neighborhoods uh, are at the bottom of the distribution and the top of the distribution. And that's very different. I think it has implications for how we confront uh, this issue. It's not just at the neighborhood level. Uh, it's at the group level. These are uh, um, figures that show the average neighborhood environments of uh, black and white children born in a cohort. This could be the, seen as the truly disadvantaged cohort, born 1955 to 1970. These are figures from the panel study of income dynamics. And then uh, roughly today's cohort, uh, uh, children born 30 years later. Um, as you can see, the racial gaps, um, so you know, a shorthand way to look at this is about two-thirds of <coughs> African-American uh, children grow up. Their average environment over childhood is in a neighborhood with at least 20% poverty um, compared to 4% of whites in the early period. Uh, those discrepancies haven't changed. Uh, they've worsened a little bit uh, for, this, for this later cohort. Um, uh, it's not just across racial groups, it's within families. The same families have experienced um, the consequences of, of uh, the forces that Bill talked about over long periods of time. So we take a perspective, or the most common perspective in the literature on, on neighborhood effects uh, in particular, is to look at the environments that families live in right now. Um, well, this is a multi-generational perspective. So what this graph is telling us is that, uh, first on the left, uh, if we take all African-American families who are currently uh, in the poorest quarter of U.S. neighborhoods, four out of five of those families have been in similarly poor neighborhoods for at least two generations, okay? So 
in looking at a single generation uh, experience, we're missing the multi-generational history um, uh, of that family. Um, Larry Katz already showed a graph about economic segregation. Uh, this goes up to 2000. I'm glad he showed his because uh, it looks like it's flattening out. Well, he went out to 2010 and, and it rose right back up. And this is with uh, data uh, using Paul Jargowski's measure, uh, Neighborhood Sorting Index. Um, and this is in all, all uh, cities of all sizes across the, across the country. Um, so this process uh, of, of uh, sorting, uh, sorting among the poor and the rich has continued and it has intensified over time. And then lastly, um, this process of the out-migration of the black middle class um, has persisted and has intensified over time. This is a figure, there's a lot going on here, but I'm, I am uh, classifying middle and upper income African American families. Okay, this is, uh, it's pretty broad, but these, these these trends show up even if you if you pare down to a smaller group. This is all families making thirty thousand dollars and up in two thousand dollars year two thousand dollars, okay. Um, and this is classifying uh, this uh, segment of the African American population by uh, what their neighborhood looked like in terms of uh, not just uh, uh, whether it was advantage or disadvantage, but what the surrounding neighborhoods were like, so there's a spatially lagged measure as well, um, by whether it was uh, majority black or, or not majority black, and by whether it was in the suburbs of the central cities. Um, the point is that in 1970, 58% uh, of middle and upper income African American families lived in neighborhoods that were not spatially advantaged, okay, so they were uh, in the lower half. Uh, of the U.S. distribution in terms of uh, the scale of concentrated disadvantage that we use, um, uh, that were located in central cities and that were majority black, okay? Um, at the top, uh, the, the group in the orange uh, shade, so less than 10%, about 6 or 7% uh, of, of this segment of the African American population lived in neighborhoods that were advantaged, meaning they were above the median of the U.S. in terms of level of uh, advantage in the neighborhood, and they were surrounded by other neighborhoods that were also above the median, okay? So advantaged neighborhoods in the suburbs that were not majority black, okay? That's where the change has, has taken place in those two categories. So we see this linear shift um, uh, as the proportion of, of uh, middle and upper income African American families have moved out of central city neighborhoods that are majority black and that are uh, relatively disadvantaged. Um, and where have they moved? They've moved into neighborhoods that are advantaged and spatially advantaged, um, that are uh, in the suburbs and that are not more majority black. This is where the major change has gone. There are still racial gaps uh, and substantial racial gaps and gaps between African Americans and Latinos. Um, uh, of, of similar income, okay? But there has been substantial change and has been essentially linear change. So the processes that, that Bill identified uh, as contributing uh, to the concentration of poverty in 1970s and, and uh, early 1980s uh, have continued. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm not going, I'm, I'm not even talking about the persistence of, of policy decisions and the other forces that are maintaining um, uh, neighborhood inequality. These are just a few demonstrations of what I mean when I talk about continuity, okay? Um, secondly, um, how does this affect how we study and how we understand uh, the consequences of neighborhood inequality? Um, we the, uh, okay, let me start with the, the, the diagram. So this is our standard model of neighborhood effects where we have uh, um, a child living in a poor or non-poor neighborhood, uh, uh, exposure to that neighborhood affects some <coughs> developmental outcome through some processes that may be specified or not specified. Okay, this model becomes much more complex uh, and we move from kind of the straightforward picture of how a neighborhood might affect a child to a much more complex set of pathways uh, by which the neighborhood environment as experienced over generations of family members may ultimately uh, affect that child's development. Okay, and some, some empirical, uh, okay, um, uh, uh, support for this comes from first, um, so that Pew report uh, um, that I did on, on uh, racial gaps and economic mobility, uh, 
uh, if we take into consideration the environments, uh, not just the neighborhood environment, but the larger spatial environment in which children are raised, um, uh, the, that gap in downward mobility uh, disappears between blacks and whites, okay? That's not, that's a, if you're confused, this is a different <laughs> figure, but that's the, that's the better summary of that finding. I'm not gonna have time to go through all these uh, figures. Um, Secondly, if we look at multi-generational exposure to neighborhood poverty, this is a study that looks at families over two generations, um, and this is adjusting for everything we can observe, which is not perfect, I understand, uh, but this is after we consider all the uh, family background characteristics in each generation. Um, this is showing us, uh, these are, this is broad reading scores uh, in the panel study of income dynamics, and, and on the right are applied problem scores. This column on the far left tells us um, uh, the average score for, for children who are never uh, in poor neighborhoods over two generations. Uh, the, the bar on the far right uh, on each side of this panel shows us the average score, again, after adjusting for everything we can observe in the PSID um, uh, for uh, children who are, are raised uh, or from families that have been exposed to neighborhood poverty for consecutive generations. Okay, so this is a multi-generational uh, story and this continuity uh, has consequences and is cumulative, okay? Um, okay, I'm not gonna have uh, much time to talk about the policy responses, but I just wanted to build on, um, on Mary's last point. When you look at, when you take a historical view of, of urban policy, the most striking thing that stands out is uh, uh, how cyclical it is, um, how there's attention paid to urban poverty uh, and initiatives and good ideas um, that are abandoned uh, or diluted um, uh, before they could have any reasonable chance to succeed. So even though some of these pro programs may not have ultimately exceeded, we, we would never know um, because they were defunded several years later. So the cycle of funding for urban programs and for attention to, to urban programs has been so erratic um, over time, which is why I, I make the case that we don't need good ideas anymore um, what we need is a durable policy agenda. We need to deal with the fact that the forces that have been at work to maintain neighborhood inequality have been at work in a consistent and stable manner for decades and probably much longer. Um, uh, the same processes that have, been, that have been at work to maintain neighborhood inequality um, uh, have been in place and have been stable for long periods of time. They've affected multiple generations of families. The same communities have been the objects of disinvestment uh, over, over decades and, and generations. We have to take this into consideration when we think about policy, okay? So when I talk about durable urban policy, uh, I'm talking about policy with the capacity to disrupt multi-generational patterns of neighborhood inequalities experienced by families to generate trans, so moving to opportunity doesn't count here, okay? Moving to opportunity is a, was a great program and we've learned it a ton uh, from it, uh, but it's, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't fall under this, uh, 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 these criteria for durable urban policy. Okay, uh, policy with the capacity to generate transformative changes in places and in families' lives um, and to withstand, and this may be the most important one, to withstand fluctuations in the political mood and the business cycle. And I give some examples, um, you know, except for this last one, there aren't many policies urban policies that have put, been put in place and that have been sustained over time. And I think this is kind of maybe the most important point here. And it's particularly salient now when, you know, as I mentioned before, the, the, uh, the Recovery Act was this enormous investment, uh, much of which went to uh, uh, disadvantaged communities across the country. Uh, it's just astounding to see how many investments uh, in these communities uh, were made. Um, and I think it had a, a, an enormous impact. Um, you know, that's a bit of speculation. But again, the Recovery Act funds are gone, okay? A lot of cities are facing budget crises. Uh, we, have, we have concentrated joblessness. We have, we have um, uh, uh, neighborhoods that have depopulated because of the housing crisis. Um, we have uh, more uh, returning prisoners uh, um, than prisoners going in for the first time in a long time, all with substantial needs as, as uh, was mentioned uh, uh, in the discussions earlier. So this, this question about how to generate sustained investments in, in communities, I think is a central one that we haven't really solved.
so thank you very much, uh, Pat. So I guess, Bruce, we're gonna have 10 to 15 minutes of questions. Yeah, so Bill first, if you want. Again, four, five actually, <laughs> excellent presentations. This has been an incredible day. So uh, I'm listening to uh, Mary Patello and I'm thinking that <clears throat> Maybe I should uh, reiterate what I said last night for the larger audience. Uh, namely that, uh, and then I have a question for uh, Doug Massey about uh, Latino immigration. But, you know, a number of people, uh, as I pointed out last night, uh, interpret uh, the truly disadvantaged as an explanation for the formation of the ghetto and were highly critical that I did not place more emphasis on race. But the truly disadvantage is not about the formation of the ghetto. If I'm gonna talk about the formation of the ghetto, I have to highlight race. That has to be the central overriding variable. It's not about the formation of the ghetto. The truly disadvantage addresses a different question that I was very puzzled about when I began writing in the, in the mid 1980s, namely, what accounts for the incredible increase in concentrated poverty from 1970 to 1980? And in addressing that question, I focused on what I thought were the major factors accounting for the incredible increase in concentrated poverty during that period, and even after 1980, actually. But I only had data from 1970 to 1980, namely, Fundamental changes in the economy, and we talked about some of those this morning, and the out-migration of higher income uh, blacks, working class blacks, middle class blacks, from inner city neighborhoods, thereby leaving behind a higher proportion of poor blacks. And then I developed a theory of the social transformation of the inner city that talked about the effects of concentrated poverty and social isolation on families and individuals, effects that were exacerbated by changes in the economy. And I just, you know, I, I regret actually that I did not highlight that point more uh, uh, so that uh, I, I could at least reduce some of the criticism I received about not emphasizing race as, as as much as I uh, can, can I just respond that, that, that mine was not a. Oh, no, 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 no. But I want to amplify one right. thing that, in some respects, while I know that was the core question of the truly disadvantaged, um, the vision of the book is much broader than what now you're, you're um, encapsulating in a nice, tidy question, which is the increase in concentrated poverty from 1970 to But that was a motivation, and then once I got into, once I addressed that issue, then I explored other things. But that was the motivation to write the book, okay. Now, the question I have, to, Doug, I found your presentation very interesting indeed. And uh, so my question is, to what extent is the sharp increase in immigration uh, related to the overall decline of uh, racial segregation? And related to that, to what extent are immigrants, uh, immigrant Mexicans, for example, moving into uh, inner city black, uh, black neighborhoods? It's part of the story, uh, uh, part of the drop in the isolation of African Americans is that uh, the formation of African American and Hispanic mixed neighborhoods. Um, um, I, it's too early in the data analysis from the 2010 census to really get a good fix on the basic question you have about what's, what's the relation between immigrants and uh, African Americans. Uh, historically, the levels of segregation between blacks and Latinos have been rather high. Not, not nearly as high as white-black segregation, but uh, not, not low either. Uh, and I don't know what the trends in Hispanic black segregation are at this point. Uh, the, the key thing about Latinos is that such a high fraction are in fact illegal. 
uh, we've never had such a large proportion of people living in the United States, at least since the days of slavery, that lacked any right at all in this country. Uh, and it's not just the adults that are at risk, it's their children, many of whom are native-born American citizens. And their, their parents' illegality puts a huge burden on their well-being. I think with Latinos right now, we're, we're at a hinge point, and it could go either way. If you look at what's, what's happened to Latinos in the past two decades, on almost every indicator of social and economic well-being, they've slid down and are now at, at roughly the same point in the distribution as African Americans. Uh, in addition, they have this added burden of illegality. And uh, a lot of what's happened is explained by the rise uh, of illegality in the Latino population. Uh, and an, if Obama's reelected, I mean, a major thing on his agenda is to come to terms with the large undocumented population and pursue some kind of immigration reform. Because unless that happens, uh, the Latino population is headed straight to the underclass uh, in, this, in, a, in a very real and powerful way. Uh, uh, and you've seen in the past decades uh, a profound racialization of Latinos demonization of Latinos, uh, placing Latinos in, a cogn in, in American social cogn cognition into the category of, of despised others. Uh, and uh, the rhetoric that's flowing out of the Republican Party toward blacks and Latinos now, I mean, it's just unbelievable. Uh, and we're really at a hinge point. Uh, and it could go either way. Uh, <laughs> And, and to be honest, it scares the living daylights out of me. Sure. Yes. Sure. Okay. Yeah, thank Ken. I've got three, Bill, if you could pass it toward Gene Rivers. Uh, I've got three people on the queue here, and we're, all, we're already over time, but so I'm going to try to we'll get at least quick. three in. We'll make it quick. Gene, um, Jennifer, no, Jennifer's out, then come to, to Mario. Okay. Okay. Um, I've been listening very carefully uh, in the discussion. In, in, in what context in engaging Bill's book do we deal with the agency of the black populations that we've been discussing? Because um, some of the rhetoric sort of revolves around, well, if Obama gets reelected, you know, then heaven, you know, you know, it'll be okay and that'll sort of fix it. And one gets no sense that the black poor have any capacity to do anything. Professor Sharkey, in your presentation, as I looked at your listing, I saw nothing about social movements and how they have over the last 60 years impacted. There's a dialectical relationship between social movements and the development of social policy. There's a fair amount of research on that. And the last point, uh, Professor Massey, in uh, the American apartheid, as I recall, you sort of didn't homogenize the, the category of Hispanic because the, to say black, white, and Hispanic is sort of methodologically, it seems to me, sort of a problem in that. Hispanic usually refers to 26 nationalities in three different races, and it's a heterogeneous category because you've got white Cubans and, and then you've got black Dominicans and black Latinos are already in the black underclass in a lot of our inner cities. So that there's a, there's a confusion in that the Hispanic category subsumes the reality of black Hispanics who catch hell like any other black. So is, is there some way that we could sharpen that so that we could get a clear sense of how race even plays out within the context of the Hispanic business? So, well, hold it. Well, let's get Pat and Doug first. Oh, then. I was going to talk about the social movements. <laughs> oh, okay. Who uh, oh, all right. The black agency part. Okay. Okay. Oh, all right. Maybe we'll do that. So, Mario, why don't you go ahead and put yours on the table, too? Two quick ones. Uh, one for Orlando. Uh, I like uh, your revised thinking on uh, integration and segregation in light of Massey and others' work. The, uh, if I'm understanding correctly, the idea is that you see uh, segregation as a kind of master cause and culture as a mechanism we've neglected to examine when looking at the relationship between segregation and the outcomes we typically care about. Um, 
I like the distinction you made between, I think you use the words uh, descriptive and uh, uh, prescriptive or behavioral and... Um, declarative and procedural. Declarative mm -hmm. and procedural. And I'm curious about which outcomes, anytime I think of a mechanism, I think about the relationship between a cause and an effect, namely an outcome. And I could imagine certain kinds of the outcomes that we've talked about as being heavily influenced by what you're calling procedural cultural mechanisms, but others it was hard for me to say. And I think of everything from health to test scores to, so what is it that we know for sure that you think that you have a sort of pretty good inference about culture and playing a role? And what, what are we likely to have to find other kinds of mechanism? And then the other question was for Patrick. I quite like the idea of uh, sort of durable urban policy. It's a tall order. Um, but it certainly seems like it points us in the right direction. But I was struck by the fact that you contrasted that to good new ideas, as in we don't need new policy ideas, what we need is a durable policy. And, and I don't know if you meant that, I'm curious about sort of why. When I saw the sort of ideas at the end, it would be Hope 6 and uh, uh, Gautreau that seemed to have sort of mixed effects, not very strong, not at a much larger scale. There actually didn't seem to be ideas there that struck me as especially promising when thinking about what's really a large-scale secular, secular uh, a trend. Okay, a lot on the table. Why don't we start <laughs> work our, Mary. Um, so on the issue of black agency, I think that's an excellent point. I have a former grad student who's coming out with a book called Black City Builders, How the Philadelphia Negro Remade Urban America, and it, it takes on that point exactly, that we often do think about how policymakers are impacting black folk, not how black folk are making decisions about where to move around the city. So I would recommend that book. But I would also, uh, kind of um, state uh, pessimism about social movements, especially in the 70s, 80s, most recent period. Um, in my own research on public housing, I gave the snippet here about public housing activists in Chicago who were doing exactly that, city, living in buildings that were deteriorating around them, hiring lawyers, bu building lawsuits. And the takeaway from that story is so depressing in terms of how what they thought were agreed on legal contracts were then pulled out from under them and how they were told, oh, well, somebody else made that contract with you. I'm the new CEO of CHA. And I don't know what they were talking about. So, you know, the, the social movements that have been waged, um, I, I'm very pessimistic about how they've been undermined time and time again through lies and failed promises and uh, so, deceit and so on and so forth. Um, a new book called Driven from New Orleans by uh, Jay Arena makes a similar point about public housing activism in New Orleans. So, Orlando, would you like to go next? Sure. Yeah, um, thanks for the question. The, um, we were sort of forced to go into the um, uh, what's going on in um, uh, sort of um, cognitive literature as we dug deeper into sort of um, finding out what's really going on in light of, you know, the fact that we have on the one hand the uh, work of some of our sociological colleagues which indicate that um, there's a lot of mainstream knowledge known among African Americans and uh, um, youth, uh, poor youth, uh, the heterogeneity argument. And um, on the other hand, the oppositional culture argument. And um, we, and so um, this, um, the, the research on which um, I'm drawing, I should emphasize, um, is partly based on uh, work which we've done with um, Jackie Cook uh, Rivers, uh, or Jackie Rivers, sorry. Um, the, the, I gather she's dropped the Cook. Um, uh, on um, uh, Afri um, African American, just chronically unemployed African American youth, about 50% of whom have had a prison record, and um, so, um, and um, sure enough, it, they know a lot in terms of the the um, the, the, the declarative knowledge. Um, they're very knowledgeable about that, and we, we focus on work. Is one area to answer your question. I mean, so um, how does it um, cultural work with that respect, and so. They know all that it takes to, um, to, 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 with respect to work. Not all, but um, um, they can ac they acquire that knowledge quite easily in training groups and so on, one of which we looked at. But um, it becomes increasingly clear that the critical issue is what you do with, uh, how, how do you, um, what is the script? What, how do you make what you know work? And that's what drove me anyway to the, um, to, to, to the cognitive literature. And that seems to be what's is missing. You can, you can know um, basic things about work in the same way, and this goes for education too, you can know the sort of um, what it is um, that you, um, you have to do. I mean, 
um, but um, how you do it is something else. And that, that, that's a critical difference here. And to just focus on the declarative knowledge, it's easy to make a case that, hey, what are you talking about? I mean, they all have the same knowledge. Um, and that, 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 that misses this, that this, this is what we found um, with respect to work. And I suspect if you look more deeply at education, um, that may be what um, are coming out. At least that's where we are right now. We've, we've had to turn to the cognitive literature to get at the mechanism, which is really the way in which culture really works. And that's where we're at. Okay, can I skip to Pat and then come back to Doug? Yeah, um, yeah so I, I, I ran through those last slides without really clarifying uh, why I was choosing those examples. Um, they weren't endorsements of, of good policies. They were, they were meant to be examples of what I mean when I refer to durable urban policy. For better or for worse, these are the programs that I listed are programs that uh, have had sustained impacts either on families um, or, or one at least can make an argument that they were, you know, Hope 6 was a transformation of public space that, is, that changed those neighborhoods for good. Okay, that's what I mean when I talk about durable not urban policy. Yeah, so they, they, it's not an endorsement saying that the effects are, are beneficial. It's more the, a, a set of principles about what types of policy we're looking for. When I say we don't need good programs, that's an exaggeration. But, you know, Promise Neighborhoods has all of the ideals that many of us think are important, just like the community action programs uh, in the late 1960s, just like Model Cities had a lot of... Uh, um, uh, characteristics that a, a lot of urban scholars were really su in support of. Um, uh, it's, it is close to, um, let, me, let me put this the right way, I don't think Promise Neighborhoods is going to have an impact on many places, okay? And it's not because the idea is not good, it's because um, it is not durable urban policy, I'll put it that way. So Doug, did you want to last? remark? <clears throat> well, just to say that I'm acutely aware of the diversity uh, within the Latino population in the United States. In fact, I've written a number of papers showing that um, black, black Hispanics are much more highly segregated than, than mixed race or um, white Hispanics. And uh, I'm doing a lot of work with Eddie Tejas on skin color stratification within the Latino population. I emphasized, um, uh, I, I uh, glided over that. Um, because of the, uh, the changes and transformations that have occurred in the Latino population since 1970, um, most of the growth has been through the mass immigration of, of Mexicans and Central Americans. Uh, uh, and the Afro-origin Hispanic population is largely of Caribbean origin. And the share of Caribbeans among the Latino population has been dropping and dropping and dropping. And unlike Mexicans and Central Americans, uh, Caribbeans tend to be legal. Uh, Puerto Ricans by def are citizens by birth. Uh, Cubans, uh, you had to work really hard to be an illegal Cuban uh, for most of the time. <laughs> and, um, and Dominicans, um, because of the vagaries of U.S. immigration and foreign policy, uh, started out as an overwhelmingly legal flow. When, uh, uh, when the U.S. invaded the Dominican Republic in 1965 after Trujillo's assassination, uh, to quell the unrest, they started to the ambassador was ordered to hand out green cards to all these student <laughs> activists. And so it began as a largely legal flow. And so uh, I think that the defining characteristic of today's Latino population is this massive increase in illegality. So that if you look at all people of Mexican origin from, you know, across the border yesterday to the 10th generation, uh, uh, it's approaching a quarter of the population is illegal. Uh, and if you look at Mexican immigrants, people born abroad, 60% of those living here today are illegal. Among Central Americans, it's two thirds to three quarters. So it's not a small segment of the population anymore. And illegality is um, uh, an irrevocable uh, barrier. Unless it's removed, uh, people will have nowhere to go, and the children of these people uh, uh, will have a huge weight on their shoulders that will hold them back for a long time. Okay. Orlando asked want, for a final comment. So I, I, I really should um, um, complete the point how it relates to segregation. Um, the, the point which is made in the literature on procedural knowledge is that it is not knowledge which can be taught. Um, it is knowledge which you learn in context. 
in relation, it's relational, and that, that was the basic point. Okay, let's thank the panelists. It was a great... Applause.